Uh, hey, everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is Mike Frohn. I am Jenny Lincoln. And this is And the Nominees Were, a podcast where we watch uh, every movie ever nominated for Best Picture. And uh, this is the start of our 1927-1928 uh, miniseries. Woo, it's a whole new year. Yeah, whole new year, whole new us. <laughs> you know, I think I... we have a whole different vibe going on now. Do we? Sure. Yeah, let's say we do. Yeah, why not? Yep. Uh, were we more prepared for this sort of thing? We could have come up with a bit, you know, about about the new us. Yeah. Um, or you you could have just gone along with my I, bit. You. I didn't. I didn't could have improvised. I'm not. Look, that's not who I am. I'm not one of your improv pals. Most certainly are not. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I've just found out we aren't friends at all. Yeah. Um, well, I guess uh, that's it. I, I, I feel like uh, I've canceled this show like three or four times already. I got to stop with that bit. Uh, the show must go on, okay. even if we are no longer on speaking terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll be, which will make it really hard to, yeah. to have a conversation. This podcast will now be relayed through our attorneys. <laughs> Who coincidentally sound exactly like us and are named Mike and Jenny. Yes. <laughs> this bit has gone on too long now. <laughs> I'll cut all of this out. Okay. Today, the plan is that we're going to talk about two different movies. Yes. Because, you know, these movies are, you know, they're old. Right. They're tough. Uh, some of them might be a little bit tougher to talk about. Yep. Um, and, like and, this one. Well, true. Yeah. I was going to say, they also, uh, you know, as we discussed, uh, will be tougher for people to watch. Yeah. So. Uh, the movie we're talking about now is uh, Chang, A Drama of the Wilderness. Yep. A uh, 1927 film directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Shudsack. Did everybody have to use their middle initial- initials back in the day? No. I think uh, I think they just thought it made them sound grander, okay. you know? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, I did learn a bit, a little bit about these guys, and they were real uh, hard scrabble adventurer types. You know, mm. uh, they went out into the jungle to make a movie because it sounded like fun. <laughs> you know, they wanted to just travel the world, and uh, if they could somehow parlay that into a career, uh, all the better. Kind of like me in podcasting. <laughs> you know, I just want to talk all the time, and so if someone pays me to do it, that would be amazing. Yep. I don't think you even particularly want to talk. You just want to watch the movies? That's true. If someone would just pay me to watch movies all day and I didn't have to do anything afterwards, that would be ideal. But, yeah. you know, we're already off topic. Um, really. <laughs> so these guys uh, just went out into the jungle and were like, Yeah, I guess... Uh, hey, what's up out here? <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, well, okay, so I guess as background, uh, these uh, these guys, Cooper Chodstack, one of these guys was a good cameraman, the other one was a good uh, showman and uh, uh, pitchman, basically, and they kind of broke into the movie business. They made this movie called Grass, which was about a nomadic uh, tribe, I think in Pakistan or Afghanistan, somewhere, somewhere on, around there. Uh, this was a big success. Uh, for the studio that released it, and then they uh, were able to get uh, Paramount Pictures to just give them a certain amount of money and to just make another one of these things, and uh, they really didn't know what they were going to get. They uh, they went off into the jungles of Thailand, and they basically just made up a story from there. They had no <laughs> idea what the story was going to be. They spent a couple months living amongst these people, uh, and then... They proceeded to uh, make everything up and, and film them doing it. This is a weird thing because it's not it's this is not quite a documentary, mm-hmm. you know. It's uh, it's a docudrama, I guess. But these are all these are all like the real people, real tribesmen, and real animals. But they're all in completely staged situations. They're okay. all recreating their daily life, you know. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. Feel free to jump in. Well. <laughs> On IMDb, which, you know, doesn't mean anything. Uh-huh. Uh, but this is still listed as the only documentary to be nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, and it's 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 as close as things came back then. You know, I think the they were following a model set up by uh, Robert Flaherty, who made Nanook of the North. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like... That was what I was going to ask, actually, was if that came first. Yeah, that was made in, I think, 1925. Okay. Maybe a little bit earlier than that, twenty, maybe even like 22, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, in the early days of film, 
uh, everything was a documentary. They didn't know they didn't. There was no term for that because they were just film things happening. Right. Because no one thought to stage things. And then when people figured out how to stage things, they realized that was a lot more interesting than just <laughs> filming a be- building being demolished or uh, filming people unloading things at the docks. This is literally like I've watched a bunch of movies from like 1900 and this is literally what they do they just they would just go over to new york city and see what was going on they just film people on the street getting their hats blown off you know (laughs) and uh you know uh stories became in vogue and it took a it took people another like decade or so to sort of marry uh the documentary footage with a story Mm -hmm. and robert flaherty went off and made nanook of the north and that is apparently just complete bullshit right uh from beginning to end uh but he the, but the difference is he sold that as a documentary yeah right okay and it and it, and i think it probably it has you know some sort of uh anthropological uh interest even if it's mostly made up you still get to see like what the north of alaska was at that time right even if it's a very small uh percentage of realism at least they did go there yeah um and then Grass comes along very much in the same uh, vein. And this as well. Chang is uh, the story of uh, a guy uh, whose name I've already forgotten. I think it's Crew. Yeah, this uh, this is a, a movie about Crew, a farmer deep in the jungles of Thailand. And you just sort of see him going about his daily life with his family, his wife, and his yeah. uh, his. Two kids, basically. It's weird how it's like that nuclear oh, it's family. Three kids, oh, it's three kids. The baby. That's true. Yep. Oh, and don't forget, uh, their pet monkey uh, is it Bimbo? Bimbo. Yeah. Bimbo. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Bimbo. What a card. What that, a character. This what a Bimbo. jokester. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> the monkey has lines. Yeah. I think it's reason. like a gibbon. And the, uh, if you've ever seen a gibbon, these are the weirdest looking monkeys. <laughs> this monkey's crazy. It's got like long human length arms and this tiny little monkey body. Yeah. And like like really long like sloth hands. Yeah. Wild. Oof. Yeah. And and yeah, they give him dialogue in the, in the title cards. Obviously, you know, this is a silent movie. And uh, so they can just make up whatever dialogue they want, right. which they absolutely which do, do. Yeah, which does make it a lot easier to make a story out of it, yes. to be honest, when you could just throw them on, on title cards. Yeah, and, and uh, the basic narrative of this movie, if there really is one, is they're constantly besieged by wild animals <laughs> right. until finally they capture one, Yeah, basically. Well, um, uh, they sort of say that, like, Crew and his family... Um, are the members of the tribe that live the furthest out into the jungle? Mm-hmm. Like they've built their their yeah, they're, uh, they're their homesteaders, home. right? In the, yeah, the parlance so, yeah. of the the you know the wild west. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, so they so they're like the only ones out there in this part of the jungle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know, and they run into trouble with animals, and they have to get help from their you know their friends and stuff in yeah. the tribe. Uh, back in the village, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then it uh, completely backfires when I'm pretty sure a crew directly causes an elephant stampede <laughs> of the entire village yeah. where all of his friends live. Yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, they don't seem to blame him at least, which is nice. Yeah, but but yeah, but it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole middle of the movie, it's like, well, because like, okay. It's basically this movie. There's basically is- like three sections. Right. There's like the first bit, like setting up his home life, setting yeah, their the family's like, home yeah. life, and then uh, the second and bit they basically go on an, on an animal hunt, right? Because yeah, because, because, because there is a wild are, animal eating are, their crops. Yeah, there's a leopard mm-hmm. that's been like trying to steal their goats, yeah. or whatever, or one actually does, mm-hmm. and then they catch another one, and then there's another one, and so he's like, he goes to to the to the tribe, and he's like. Look, these these leopards, man, they're killing me, and uh, and they're like, yeah, we're gonna send thirty guys. Yeah, we're gonna catch every goddamn animal. Yeah, and yeah, so they have a big old hunt, and uh, and then there's still some wild animal about, and then they finally catch him in the pit, and it's a Chang. And oh he, yeah, yeah, uh, yep. it's a big, uh, it's a big reveal. Yep, and it's they, a baby elephant. Yep, a little tiny elephant. Yep, it was adorable. Yep, it was cute. And then they decide, we're going to keep this elephant. Yeah. And uh, all the other elephants get real mad about it. Yeah. And then there's a giant elephant stampede uh, through the village. Uh, 
I think they, they eventually do uh, figure out how to capture all of them. They build this giant pen. Yeah. Uh, and they sort of funnel all the elephants in, and then they yep. can't get out. Yep. And, and then they decide to use the elephants to help them mill rice or something. Yeah, like something that. like that. I don't know. I so mean, everything. It, yeah, everything turns out for the best for everybody except you know the elephants and all all those leopards and tigers and stuff that they yeah. killed. Yeah, um, you know, in, you know, in reality, uh, elephants are sort of like beasts of burden in that area. They often uh, they often are domesticated. Uh, it can take a while, but uh, right. uh, and apparently the uh, the elephants. Who stampede in this movie are actually uh, the I think the king of Siam's uh, like personal uh, elephant herd. Oh man! Yeah, uh, yeah. It's kind of interesting. They uh, they you know went into uh, Thailand, but you know this is in 1927. Uh, Thailand is you know it's a modern country. I mean it's you right. know. It's yeah, still I was gonna a, say it's my, a developing nation, but yeah, there's still my context for like Siam is like you know the king and I yeah, and the, uh, but that is in the 1800s. Yeah, I want to say but this is like so, you know this is this even is like so there a there good is good amount of time after yeah, that. There is you know there is this sort of you know royalty and government. It's not just uh, like uh, uh, no man's land. Uh, and but they they did find they, they did specifically go to like the most remote part of the country, right? And it's a region the size of like I think New Jersey or something like that, where it's just all jungle. Okay. And uh, but they but they did have a lot of help of of the you know the the Thailand government, uh, and so they had all these resources there at their disposal, like the, the like tamed elephants to stampede, <laughs> you know, rather than trying to find about that many wild elephants. Right. Oh man, can you imagine trying to find like twenty wild elephants? Yeah, and you're and like, stay the- right here, okay? Yeah, and Come now on. run. Yeah. <laughs> now run at these buildings. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess the. Maybe the most interesting part of this movie for me now is, and maybe the most exciting for a modern viewer is the 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 footage of these animals. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a real novelty at the time to to get to see up close footage of elephants and tigers and. Uh, and leopards and yeah, bears. Yeah, they didn't have like planet Earth. Back yeah, then. and and nowadays, you know, it's it's much more common. But right. even so, they get closer to these animals than they ever do on planet. Earth. I feel like you know the planet Earth phenol- philosophy is uh, well, one, don't get eaten by animals. Yeah, and two, don't bother their environment. You know, yeah. stay back, observe. Uh, and uh, Cooper and Chodzak's philosophy was. Get that, get that beautiful footage. Shoot the animals. We don't care. I, I want to see teeth. I want, I want carnage. You know, they were, uh, they were showmen. I, uh, I feel like you probably because you watch document. Um, sorry, uh, commentary. And stuff. Yeah, I listened to the audio commentary for this, uh, and I, I don't want to just summarize the commentary. So I'll like leave some. I'll mention some choice bits, but I highly recommend. Uh, find this movie on DVD and listen to the commentary if this sort of thing excites you. you know? um, but, uh, you know, I just read the trivia. Yeah, instead. of course. That's the, the easy way to go yeah. about this. And uh, there were two of them that I felt like might be related. Yeah. Uh, one was that Cooper had malaria throughout the whole shoot. Yeah. Uh, and the other was that, uh, what, what, how do you say the other guy's name? Shodzak. Shodzak. Uh, did most of the filming while Cooper covered him with a rifle. So yeah, so like were they just they were just like pointing like a camera in a tiger's face and Cooper standing there just sweating yeah and, like, just in, with, ca- in with case a rifle. yeah in <laughs> case anything happened yeah he was covering him I I remember another thing from the commentary where uh, there's a shot uh, during this uh, animal hunt in the middle of the movie one of the the pack uh, of of men uh, mm-hmm. hunting these uh, animals. Uh, kind of gets lost and uh, gets right near a tiger. Right. And he like, runs up the tree. Yeah. And uh, and everybody has to come over and like save yeah. him. Yeah. But there's there's a shot from his perspective looking down at the tiger yeah, pawing yeah. up the tree. Mm-hmm. And you know the only way they did that is you know go up a tree and uh, film this tiger. And uh, I forget which one of the two guys was up there, but they said that uh, you know they they 
somehow researched this or maybe i don't know there was a maybe there was another movie where there was tiger footage or something where uh they had heard that uh a tiger can leap about uh 11 feet in the air and so uh so he went up to 13 feet on this uh on this tree and shot downwards and guess what tigers can jump a little bit higher than that <laughs> Uh, so this tiger was getting all the way like like you know half a foot from this camera and and this guy is just you know uh going nuts like oh shit i might die right now but i might as well get some footage while i'm up here and th- these guys were fearless i i don't i don't admire sir that sort of thing but it is it is interesting to hear you yeah. know uh, there's not that sort of thing nowadays it's it's you know, it's better that people don't risk their life to make movies, but I like that two crazy people did. Right. You know, and we and this is what we get back. Yep. And that sort of stuff. That's that's the most interesting stuff to me uh, in this movie is the parts where they're literally three feet away from a tiger. Yeah. And they're just yep. hoping they don't die. Right. And there's no other plan. <laughs> It is unfortunate though that they uh, they shoot those tigers. Yeah, it is unfortunate, especially because they those would basically tigers full on die. Yeah, and uh, apparently the these tribesmen uh, try as hard as possible not to kill these animals in general, but the but these guys thought it would be uh, a better spectacle for the camera if they got some some animal shots. Uh, it is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, I you know, animals die in this movie. Maybe right. don't watch this movie if yeah. you don't want to see animals die. Right. Um, um I will say uh however there are two bears in it. Yeah. And the bears live. So Bears are um, wonderful. Yep. I gave this movie on Letterbox. I gave it two stars for mm-hmm. the two bears. That's nice. Yeah. Who were the two stars of the they movie? They were the two stars of the movie in yeah. my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this one this movie is a tough movie to uh gauge on any sort of scale or review um because it is so old it's really a, you know it's it's almost a relic you know right. you're, you're watching this to be transported to a time when this was you know the height of entertainment yeah you know? exactly yeah uh it's not so much you're not so much going to get entertainment value out of it now there's so many different things you know uh if you want if you wanted to learn about uh, tribesmen in Thailand, this is not really the movie to do that. You could watch any sort of, yeah. uh, you know, documentary series. If you want to watch footage of wild animals, you can watch, uh, you know, Planet Earth or Wild Planet okay. or whatever you want to do. Um, and this also is, it's a narrative movie, but it's not really the kind of movie that would go on to be nominated for awards and that would, uh, could, that they would continue to make in this industry. Uh, you know, I think even Cooper and Shudsack, uh This movie was a big success at the, at the time. By the way, it was for a time the most profitable movie, um, maybe in history, but at least in the history of Paramount Pictures. Okay. Because the, they just paid two guys to go into the jungle, and you know they though they didn't have to pay anybody to do anything in the jungle. It was just a cameraman and you know these people, and. So this was a big success at the time. It uh, it ran for a long time in these big theaters. But uh, Cooper and Shodzak, they didn't really do anything like this again. They they still would go on like adventures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think their next movie, I think, was The Four Feathers, which uh, is like a war epic. I know uh, the version of it with uh, with Kate Hudson. And- yeah, they've made it. They made that story a couple times. It's like I think about the Boer War uh, in Africa. That sounds right. Yeah, I and, actually don't remember. Yeah, I did I see remember. it, but I have almost no memory yeah. of it. And so they, you know, they would they went off and shot location footage for that, but it is much more of a story with like movie stars and dialogue and stuff. And then they would go on to make King Kong, which follows uh, the same sort of model. It's you know, uh, it's the same sort of thing that they're interested in, which is are these far off lands where anything can happen. But this is a completely fantastical story, and I don't know if they even did any location shooting for mm-hmm. that movie um so this is an interesting uh it's it's an interesting artifact of its time when this was a very popular movie but also i think studios quickly realized like maybe it's better if we control the product a little right. bit more you know mm-hmm. okay 
I don't know. That's, and that's also, just a guess. you know, uh, I imagine as well that they were like, well, people are really responding to this movie star thing. Yeah. And you can't. You can't put movie stars in the jungle. Exactly, and that, well, and I think that's where the, these sort of hybrid things like Four Feathers and Kong came from. They're like, okay, but uh, you know, people really like shots of tigers and stuff. But you know, what if you get uh, someone else in there too? What if you get a real hot guy? Right. Um, that's what I want out of movies, honestly. Just a hot guy. A hot guy and a bear. Yeah. Yeah. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Yeah. Um. Um. Actually, uh, this is. Not really related, but I did want to share now this l- the little fun fact that I liked. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, one of the film's more unusual publicity angles was to suggest projecting it in zoos in order to watch the surprised reaction of animals at seeing themselves on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Not many zoos took up this suggestion. No, uh, yeah, I can understand that. Any final thoughts on this movie? I feel like I I kind of gave no, my little okay. review um, and you didn't really. I don't know what, what were I, you, how did you feel about this movie? Um, you know, I I appreciate it more listening to you talk about it uh-huh. because I watching it thought uh well, this is boring. Um and the animals are good and yeah. they are killing them. And yeah. uh and also why does the monkey have lions? <laughs> Like, it's ridiculous. It's, it's so insane. It's, it's, I love. It's, and his name is Bimbo. And his name is Bimbo. Oh, it's it's that's oh, yeah. wonderful and and ridiculous. Yeah. And like when the elephants are stampeding, like you know the the mom like takes the the baby and like make, you know makes a run for it, and, mm-hmm. and Bimbo is jumping around the room like, don't forget your little Bimbo. And you're like, <laughs> you're you're a god, you're a monkey. Just run away. Like, what are you doing? Like yeah. ridiculous, you know that that brings up there. There's the yeah. There's the shot during the elephant stampede where you know there's the little baby just they they somehow left the baby sitting on the ground, and you know there's a close up with the baby, and then you know the mom realizes and she runs in and gets it before the elephants. Uh, I mean, and you know knowing how this movie was made, it's clearly such like. Well, I, I mean, it's it's weird because it's such like a you know a dramatic movie sort of thing. Right. You know, it's clearly such manufactured drama in yeah. this documentary. But it, it's still that moment still is sort of effective as you know as just pure movie making. Yeah, you know, I agree. With it's that. you kind of your brain sort of forgets that you're supposed to be watching a, a thing that's really happening. Well, uh, I I that's the thing. I never while watching this movie thought that any of it was really happening. Yeah, it's and it, one of the reasons when you know how you mentioned the the where the guy has to run up the tree to get away yeah. from the tiger and like for one thing I was like oh that that dude is there and there's a tiger there. Yeah. But I also knew that they had to have staged all of this because. That man wasn't carrying a camera when he ran up exactly. that tree. Yeah, it's so. yeah, it's such a weird little mishmash hybrid of things. Uh, it's not quite effective as either documentary or drama. There's yeah. there's little bits and pieces here and there that are really effective at one of those yeah, things. Right, but you have to yeah, kind of like. Grain of salt with yeah. all this. Yeah, yeah like uh, the documentary footage of the animals can still be very exciting now. And there are some moments like that baby thing that are effective as as just dramatic storytelling with the camera. But yeah, as a whole, it's not it's not really a cohesive uh, uh, film. Right. And, you know, you said you were bored. I, I was bored, too. I, I'm trying to, you know, right. dig a little deeper into this. But it but was short. It was short. This is a uh, an hour like an and hour, nine minutes, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 almost nothing. Yeah, uh, if you know, I would I would recommend this movie if you're interested. I don't think this right. is, I don't, this it's, is not going to be the movie to uh, turn you around on silent film. Yeah, or anything I was going like to that. say if you're not particularly interested in you know older movies and stuff like that, I wouldn't watch this just because it's nominated. For. Yeah for a best picture Mm -hmm. but if you think that it sounds interesting to watch you know a an old-timey docudrama about Mm -hmm. the jungle yeah then yeah check it out and you know when i was on letterboxd uh a couple people that i follow have seen this movie and rated it and uh i think they enjoyed it a little bit more than i did and maybe maybe other people would too uh You know, I gotta you know admit that we were eating pizza and we were a little bit sleepy. <laughs> That's true. We'd been walking around for a while and we came home and ate pizza and got got real uh real groggy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so that's Chang. Uh, this movie that's Chang. was 
only nominated for the one award, um, unique That's and artistic I guess, production. Like, you couldn't really nominate it for acting, acting or yeah, I guess you uh, could have gotten a director. Have, thing, I, but, well, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, they had best director and stuff. Yeah, but this uh, they also just did not have as many nominees. Like they had the okay. one winner and maybe one or two like runners up. They didn't oh, have okay. a whole list yeah, of five okay. nominees. Um, uh, yeah, I can I can see how this is. You know. Uh, there's the two categories, unique and artistic production and outstanding production. And I can, this is a very unique production. Right. There's not a whole lot of movies like this at the time and not even so much now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is, is it artistic? I don't know. A little bit, I guess. Whatever. And also, uh, cynically, if it really did make that much money, like, no wonder they wanted to give it some kind of recognition. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, that's it for Chang. Uh, now let's get into... <laughs> let's pivot gracefully. To The Crowd. Uh, Crowd, a 1928 movie directed by King Vidor. Great name. Yeah, a wonderful name. Uh, nobody's just named King anymore. No, that's true, and it's sad. Uh, except, uh, King's Hawaiian. <laughs> Did you hear, uh, Arby's is doing some weird promotion where they, uh... They were going to pick six people. They were going to fly six people out to Hawaii to eat their new Arby's sandwiches on King's Hawaiian bread. Okay. And then they were going to fly them right back. It was a twenty <laughs> uh, within twenty four hours. All expenses paid, but you were only there for twenty four hours. You got to... no hotel room, and you only ate Arby's, and then they flew you right back. That sounds not worth it. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, yeah. It's kind of that's kind of the joke, I suppose. Yeah. Um, would definitely not be worth it. Or maybe if I lived in L.A., I'd be like, yeah, sure, why not? I'll right. get to go to another state for an hour, you know. Yeah. But not from New York. No. It's ridiculous. Um, speaking of New York, <laughs> the crowd. The crowd. Yeah. It's crowd. about New York. Yeah. Uh, kind of. This is a movie that is very easy to summarize. It's about a guy and his life. That's it. That's the <laughs> whole movie. <laughs> That's true. It's about a guy who thinks he's going to be somebody. Yeah. Uh, but and instead he's somebody's that he- fool. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't know that he has to actually do anything. Try. Yeah. yeah. Um so yeah, this movie I I related to this movie <laughs> harsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I did too, unfortunately. Yeah, while we were watching it, uh you kept talking about how the dude was the worst and he is sort of the worst, but I was like I was the worst. <laughs> yeah. Once probably still am. <laughs> But yeah, I I almost said to you, except I want to say it on here. I believe this may be cinema's first fuckboy. <laughs> like, honestly, I don't know. Uh, Casanova. Ooh, they probably mm-hmm. made a Casanova movie before this. Well, he's literally a fuckboy. Yeah, but in that he fucks. Yeah, this guy doesn't really fuck. Well, no. he fucks I, well, at least he, twice. At least twice. He has two yeah. kids. But. Uh, yeah. Yes, so this is a movie about a guy named Johnny Sims and every man. Uh, who uh, his father dies when he was a teenager, and his father always wa- said he was going to be somebody. He was going to be a great man someday. And his father died before he could really give uh, Johnny any sort of guidance on what that means. Right. And so he kind of just coasts through life. He gets to New York. He's like, yeah, New York, that's where you make it. That's where you do stuff. Yeah, uh, and he gets a job uh, just as a as a cog in a wheel. Yeah, basically. Yeah, his job seems to be copying numbers down. Yeah, into ledgers. Which like, like he doesn't even seem to be doing math. He doesn't yeah, seem to I be don't, an accountant. I don't he think seems so. To just be copying numbers. I mean, I'm sure before they had computers and stuff, that was a thing people had to do. Copy yeah. you know, copy out before they had copy machines, right. really. Uh, I totally would have taken that job. Whatever. Yeah, what word? <laughs> as long as I can listen to podcasts. Or <laughs> um, but yeah, he just sort of he gets a job doing the same thing everybody else is doing. Yep. For like half a minute, he's like, "Oh no, I gotta, I gotta study so I can achieve things and be good at business." And he has a, he says this to his friend when they're like, no, his friend's like, let's go down to Coney Island with these babies who've got what ain't in books, <laughs> which I remember because that was the screenshot when we had a pause and tremendous. Yeah. These, them babies have got what ain't in books. Yeah. Um, and he meets this girl, Mary, I think is yeah. her name, right? And yeah. John and Mary. Yeah. 
and uh, they just and sort they get, of yeah, they, they just, just sort of hit it off. They spend a nice day in Coney Island with uh, this other couple, and uh, and then he they proposes just, to her literally immediately. And she's at like, the yeah, end of sure, the day. why not? Uh, yep. And they get married. They go off to Niagara Falls. Uh, they yeah. do it on a waterfall. Yeah, right. Exactly. I don't know if they do that, but uh, it certainly seems see, like it. Yeah, it totally seems like it. And they, uh, they settle down into their life, and it's yeah, tough. Her, her family doesn't like him yeah. because they uh, recognize him as a shiftless layabout. Yeah. Um, and although they are jerks to him, so it's understandable that he does not like them either. Yeah. Um. So. I don't know. They think he's never going to make anything of himself, and uh, they're right. He doesn't. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, they just sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. This first, well, I was going to say this first part of the movie, but it's kind of just the whole movie. It's, it progresses early on very, you, you see like a day at a time, but like a couple months pass in between. It's right. It's like showing yeah. their whole like. Uh, you know, first year of their relationship or so, but it's only in little snippets. You see, like, their first date, and then they get married, and you see their honeymoon. Then you right. see their first Christmas together, and then the, uh, just this one random day a couple months in to marriage where just stuff's not going oh, right, and yeah. they're both sniping yeah, at each yeah. other. Because they live in this, like, cheapo apartment, yeah. and nothing and everything's, works. Yeah, everything's broken. And he's blaming her, even though he never fixes anything. Mm-hmm. He always just expects her to do it. Mm-hmm. He's off. He's off. Uh, he's off bringing home the bacon. Is he? He's off bringing home the I don't know eight cents an hour or whatever. <laughs> right, he got. whatever it is. Um, and uh, and then they have fight, but then up oh, turns out she's pregnant, and then uh, and then everything is better. Uh, <laughs> right. And Just then for a time. Yeah. Uh, and then you you know you see her give birth. Uh, a couple months later. Yeah, and that's rough. And he's like, oh man, this this is hard. I gotta take care of this lady. Yeah. And then immediately stops doing that. Well, yes. But then it just cuts to five years later and then they had another kid. Yeah, they've had another kid. I, I love having... the thing that the title card says like the, the only eventful things in the last five years were they had another kid and he got an $8 raise. Yep. Yeah, that is <laughs> a great that's a great title card. Yeah. And then they're having a picnic on the beach where again, uh, she's trying to feed everybody and take care of the children, and he's sitting there fucking off on a ukulele. Yeah, he's like, hey, this is our fun time. We're supposed to be out having fun. He's like, I'm cooking for everybody like I always do. This is not a vacation for me. Yep. And, like, when she even tries to get him to, like, watch his children while he's fucking Mm -hmm. off on the ukulele, he, like, gives her a hard time about it. Yeah. Yep. And then their child steps in the cake. Yeah. I did like when he had to take his son to go pee behind the post. That was the kind of it's the kind of thing I just didn't didn't expect to see in a movie from 1928 yeah. or so. That yeah, that is kind of funny. So Johnny always says that he's going to, you know, he's he's always trying to come up with ad slogans and whatnot, mm-hmm. but he never sends them into these contests. So they're on the beach, and she's like, and he comes up with one, and she's like, "Oh, that's pretty good. Why don't you send it in?" So he does, and they win money, and they get so excited uh, about all the things that they're going to buy that uh, that their baby child runs in front of a car, yeah, and is killed. Yep, yep, and it is sad for everybody. It's very sad, and he does not take it well. No, even uh, even. <laughs> Even considering how poorly one would take such news, he takes right. it even he, worse than that. Worse than that, exactly. And he just can't he can't work anymore. He quits his job because they're giving him a hard time. And uh, and then he just doesn't get another job, or he, he keeps trying he keeps, to get a little yeah, odd keeps jobs. Getting jobs and then like quitting them after like a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So nothing's going right, and then uh, and then he and Mary they have a big old fight. She kicks him out, uh, and then uh, he tries to. He was gonna jump off a train trestle. Yep. Even though he's there with his son, because yeah. cool, mm-hmm. he's a cool guy, John. Yeah, but his son is like, "Daddy, I love you. I'm gonna grow up to be just like you." And dad's like, "But I suck." And the kids like. Yeah, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> My dad. Dads are cool. And, and so Johnny realizes that people love him even when he screws up. It's okay that he screws up sometimes. Yep, as long as he tries. And so yeah. then he goes out and he gets a job as a 
cl- juggler dressed as a clown, which is a job that he made fun of on his and Mary's first date. Yeah, so when they're yeah circle. they're riding on a double decker bus, and he just uh, points out uh, the top. And he's like, "Look at this rube." Uh, yeah. I, I think he says like uh, in his oh, his yeah, mother his, thought he would his, be president yeah. someday. Yeah. He says it, specifically his father. Oh uh, yeah, so yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's just don't yeah. matter. And it's just movie. this guy in a sandwich board juggling uh, in clown makeup to try to get people to to eat at Joe's or whatever. Yeah. And John makes fun of him, and then uh, and then that's what he's doing at the end of the movie. Yep. But he's like, hey, I made money. I'm doing it. Right. I'm being a good person for my yep. family. Yep. I remember when uh, when it first comes up when they they're make on the the double decker bus and they're making fun of the the clown juggler man. Uh, I turned to you and I said, "So this is a movie about a couple jerks, right?" <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Mary kind of stops being a jerk. She kind of stops being a jerk. Yeah, she doesn't really do anything yeah, else. Yeah, they jerk-ish. they get in they get in fights, but it's like understandable right. fight sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, she's basically a normal human being. Right. Uh, Johnny is too. Uh, this whole this movie is interesting because it's it's so real. It feels mm-hmm. very real. Even uh, you know, uh, almost a hundred years later. Yeah. Uh, these characters feel very much like people, like like you and me uh, at times. Right. Uh, but it is also very heightened you know yeah uh, they, oh yeah they the acting in particular is extremely melodramatic yeah but but i mean you kind of had to do that in the in days the without time, because silent, your yeah. your facial expressions your hand expressions that's what conveyed what you were saying when you didn't have right. a title card you you know yeah you had to you know re- arch your eyebrows back real far when you yeah. were sad you know yeah throw your head back mm-hmm. you know Hands up in mm-hmm. the air, etc. Yeah. Yeah. But so, like, uh, you know, when they have a fight in this movie, uh, they'll, you know, a line here and there will really ring very true. But the, but the whole like totality of their fighting, it's very heightened because right. it's, it's like they get mad at each other like instantly over nothing, you know, which that happens sometimes. Yeah. But, but you know, it, it feels. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, the thing with the title, the the name, the crowd, it's like yeah. Uh, there are a couple the be- of different ways it comes in. Yeah, towards they- the beginning of the movie, you see Johnny on a on a boat to New York. He's like he's t- just talking to some old guy on the boat. He's like, see that that city? I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be a big city man and be good. And the guy is like, oh, you're gonna have to. To try really hard to stand out in the crowd or something like that. Right. Uh, suggesting that he's, you know, uh, you're just going to get sucked into New York, basically. Yeah. Um, but it comes up. It comes up a couple of times, though. There, I mean, that's the when it's uh, specific, when it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, explicit in the text. Yeah. Like the, as far as the titles, uh, the dialogue, as it were. But. But there are a couple of different. There's a couple of different actual physical crowds yeah, in the movie. That's true. There's um, right at the be the beginning of the movie when, um, or it's you know basically right at the beginning of the movie when a Johnny is a is a kid and his dad dies. Uh, you know the the oh yeah. There's this one wonder- for their house. Yeah, this yeah. Shot. There's this wonderful shot. Uh, it's it's maybe the first very like expressionistic shot in the movie. Uh, uh there's a. Uh, you know, he's hanging out with his friends across the street and they see like an ambulance pull up to his house. And so he goes to see what's going on. And there's a whole, uh, there's a whole crowd gathered around uh, the front door to his house. And they sort of beckon Johnny up the stairs. And this the camera is placed like at the top of these stairs. And you see like his, his mother go up and then it's just like him just at the bottom of these stairs and he goes up and up very slowly while this entire crowd at the bottom is just watching him. Yeah. Uh, and it zooms so like they're getting farther away even though he's mm-hmm. not moving that fast up the stairs. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. But yeah, it's like the hallway like lengthens. Yeah, it's it looks great. Yeah, uh, I remember I did watch an interview with King Vidor uh, years later, uh, talking about this shot where you know they he said they just uh, that was just the door to the stage and uh, the stair was just 
stairwell way they had that led to nothing and they just they just took a big flat and and painted lines on it so it looked like you know a the roof of a stairwell leading down mm. and just plopped it in front of the door and it's at the end it's a very sort of like german expressionist thing where you just like paint broad uh straight lines uh-huh. to represent you know what's going on and the the movie is for the most part shot very uh like realistically i think but there are these little touches here and there like that that really just sort of uh I, I think they they they're usually used to sort of like emphasize like his Johnny's place in the crowd right, of people you exactly. know there's that there's also when he first gets to New York yep. there's a wonderful shot panning up an entire office building and then zooming in on a window and there's this crane shot from above and you just see like rows upon rows of desks of people working and he's just smack dab in the middle and the camera just goes right up to his face there in the desk which uh that shot was uh completely ripped off in a wonderful way by billy wilder in the apartment uh jack lemon's office in that movie he's just like the middle guy and just rows and rows of of desks okay yeah that looks great though yeah like it's little black squares overhead it's all cubes and it's Mm -hmm. all yeah uh it's i don't know the word for it i was gonna say almost um with the building and the and the square, uh, almost brutalist, but I don't know that that's what I mean yeah, exactly. It's yeah, I, I don't know. The building is sort of because the building is like Art Deco. It's yeah, you know, sort of like a or almost like a like a Bauhaus German uh, building. A right, bit. right. Um, yeah, I don't know if you could pin it to any particular style. But I just meant the overall feeling, though, of all the squares, all mm-hmm. the homogeneity, etc. Yeah. <laughs> That's the word you were trying to think of. Yeah, we said that last week. I'm still yeah. not convinced it's a real word. I'm saying it is. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, but so there's that. Then there's also um, when when the baby gets killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the 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 little kid who I was convinced was a girl, but but I think they say it's a boy at some point. <laughs> but that. That baby has some Shirley Temple curls. I mean, they used um, to. Uh, I feel like children's haircuts ba- back in the twenties. They were very uh, androgynous. There, okay. it was like one hairstyle for children. For children, okay. Yeah. Either way, it's a, it's a cute child. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the baby gets killed, um, the like you know a huge mass of people crowds around it. Yeah, and um, and he has to fight his way through the crowd to get to the baby to, and then has to fight through the crowd to bring the baby up the stairs and is yelling that somebody has to call a doctor and nobody's doing anything. They're just watching him and watching mm-hmm. the baby. And yeah, it's so there's a crowd. And then mm-hmm. there's also, you know, just after that, when, uh, when the baby is sick and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they don't know whether or not, uh, it's going to live or whatever. And the doctor's up there. Uh, he and he's trying to shush everybody. He's trying to make everybody silent. Yeah, and like, like out in the street, there's just there's a fire. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, there's a fire, fire drill, but it's also just like people living their life, and mm-hmm. he kind of just wants everybody to to shut up so yeah. his baby will live. And he's going out there, and he's literally just like you know everybody's like walking one way, like they're coming home from work, like it's rush hour, and he's just trying to to worm his way through there. He's like fight, like fighting against the current of people, yep. just like begging everyone to please be quiet. Yep. And that's a and wonderful that, image. And it's a great moment where the the cop or whatever comes up and says, "The world can't stop because your baby is sick." Yeah. It's like ah. Uh, like nope, no, it can't, and mm-hmm. he, and he's right, but like, but of course you want it to, yeah, you know, like, of course, uh, and it's sad, and then the baby dies, yeah, yeah, like basically, I think before he gets back up there either, mm-hmm. and then everybody acts really hard for like three minutes, <laughs> so, um. But then there's one more. There's another crowd, which I can't... Oh, well, and then he has to fight in all the crowds when he finally decides he's going to get a job, mm-hmm. too. Uh, he has to fight with crowds to, to get jobs. That You know, there's, like, huge lines of people, because it'll be, like, a hundred city jobs needed. Yeah. And, like... And nobody will let him in the line, because he's trying to bust into the middle of it like mm-hmm. a fuckboy. <laughs> and, like... And they're... 
And he's like, I need this job. I have a wife and a kid. And this guy is like, well, so do I and many of these men. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, so he doesn't get that. Yeah, and it's interesting. This movie was made like two years before the Great Depression. Right, but it feels like it's happening during the Great Depression. Yeah. Like that end part in particular mm-hmm. where everybody's just is rushing and lining up to get these jobs and they don't even care what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I actually thought about that. Do, did, did they know, like, because I always got the impression that the, the Great Depression was a thing that just happened and it took everybody yeah, by surprise. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, uh, I've never really looked into it, but I have to imagine, they didn't know there was going to be a Great Depression, but I have to imagine the Great Depression was preceded by you know a small depression and then Mm. then it became a huge depression you know i feel like that's usually how those things work okay it's like yeah things aren't great right now either they'll get better or they'll get a lot worse right and then that time they got a lot worse womp womp Mm -hmm. um yeah i unfortunately don't know if i have anything else to say about yeah i don't know i I enjoyed this movie a lot because it it felt so real to me in a way that a lot of these silent movies don't always. Uh, even the ones that are the most like emotionally affecting, they tend to the emotions tend to be like so heightened and stuff. But you know, this guy just going through life thinking that uh, he's uh, owed something it, that feels so uh, timeless, you know? Yeah. And there, actually, that reminds me, one of the reasons I didn't like this movie particularly, I did think it was very modern. Yeah. Um, But one of the things I thought was so modern, and this is actually, this is another crowd that I forgot to mention, is it's very cynical. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's, like, especially, like, at the very end, because, like, Mary's gonna leave him, you know, her brothers are always like, this guy is a loser, why don't you just come back home? Mm -hmm. And she's gonna finally do it. And then he shows up and he's like, look, I got this job. I'm a juggling clown now. Uh, I, I got some money. Uh, you know, well, and she's like, no, nah, forget it. I'm, I'm, you're the worst. I'm out of here. And he's like, well, I bought tickets for us, the two of us and our son to go to the show when I thought everything would be okay. Will you at least come to the show? And mm-hmm. she's like, yeah, okay. And they dance around to a record and everything's okay. And then they go to the show. And it's a big vaudeville thing, and they're laughing, and they're having a good time, and it just kind of, like, pans out over the whole crowd of people, and they're all mm-hmm. just laughing, like they don't have a care in the world, mm-hmm. and, and like, none of them matter in this big crowd, and everybody's just laughing, like their lives don't matter, and I was like, this is the bleakest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> I didn't think it, it didn't seem that bleak to me. I thought it was. I thought it was saying, well, you might as well enjoy yourself because your life isn't worth anything. Well, I mean, That was the message I took away from this movie. I do know that uh, apparently uh, the studio had Louis B. Mayer. He wasn't happy with the uh, how uh, depressing the ending was. And he had uh, King, uh, King Vidor shoot at least like seven different endings to the movie but uh this was the one they always wanted to have okay and i i I, you know i can see how it is depressing but i can also it's also uplifting i think in a way you know uh because well i guess it kind of is because he was gonna kill himself and yeah but also and he's still enjoying life yeah but but i also think you know he is a guy who his entire life he thought he was supposed to do something better than what he was doing, and I th- I feel like the ending finally puts him just as one other person like everybody else, and I I, I think it it's sort of showing him as maybe just realizing that he's just got to you know hunker down and do work and just like anybody, and he can have a wonderful life, and he doesn't you know oh you know what he has to show for is what he has to show for it. He's not, right. he's not going to be any better, uh, a, a person, you know, for having more stuff. He has, he has a wife, he has a kid, uh, he has, has a job. He's, uh, he works hard and that's, that's all there is to it. And he is enjoying himself. At the end of the movie. That's a more, uh, generous reading. And mm-hmm. I like it. Mm-hmm. I think, I think they're equally valid ways yeah. of looking at it, but I, but I, the impression I took away from it when we watched it, I was like, 
this shit's dark. <laughs> I don't like this. Uh, the uh, the letterboxed review that I liked after we watched it, um, it was somebody just said, uh, even in 1928, they knew the American dream was dead. <laughs> and I was like, yep, that's this movie. Um, there was also, what was, oh, I wanted to talk about Bert a, just a little bit. Yeah, uh, Johnny is sort of best friend, even though they don't seem that close particularly, no, but he's like, close enough. he's a co-worker, yeah. and, uh, you know, they go out together to Coney Island at the beginning of the movie, uh, Bert's this sort of playboy type, even though he's right. like this, uh, this chubby guy. Yep. Um, uh, uh, but, like, at one point, Johnny goes over to his place to see if he has any more uh, bootleg liquor. Yep. And he ends up dancing the yeah, night away with his girls. On Christmas, on which Christmas. is why it's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Instead of coming back home to the family, he hangs out with Bert and, he, and his mm-hmm. two random girlfriends. <laughs> the worst, too, was when he comes home after he's been gone for hours drinking. Uh, he's like, yep, Bert didn't have anything. <laughs> I was like, you, yeah, you suck. Yeah, You're the worst. Was, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Bert. This is the thing. So Bert, at the very beginning, when they go to Coney Island, he's the one who's like, oh, come out to come out with me and these girls. And Johnny's like, no, I have to study. And I remember we were like, study what? Bu- study business? Mm-hmm. Like, what are you? What are you studying? And it's never clear. But uh, but he doesn't do it for the yeah. rest of the movie. He never studies anything, mm-hmm. so it doesn't matter. Uh, but then, like, later on, you know, there's these two uh, interactions, and then there's also, uh, you know, Bert uh, gets a promotion. He uh, he gets the, the, the real job. Johnny's always talking about how when his ship comes in, mm-hmm. this is, you know, and this and that. Uh, but but it happens for Bert. He gets the promotion, and, and Mary says something to Johnny about it at one point, and Johnny's like, well, sure, I could get this promotion, too, if I wanted to hang out with the bosses all day. Like, <laughs> you've... What is... And I was, oh god, this fucking guy, like, like if you, if this isn't what you want to do, that's one thing. But he's like, yep, he's like, I'm gonna be great at this thing. I'm just not gonna do any of the things I need to do for it, and it'll be fine. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah, it sounds like me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so those were my thoughts on Bert. Bert, Bert, Bert got. Bert got shit done, is what I'm saying. Yeah. He had a good time, Mm -hmm. and then he was like, you know what? I'm going to get shit done. And then he did. So, like, good for him. He was the real catch all along, (laughs) is all I'm saying. It's true. And I really thought at the end of the movie, you know, how Johnny does these advertising things. Mm -hmm. They go to the vaudeville show, and there's an advertisement in the playbill or whatever for the thing that he gave them the slogan for. Yeah. And he, like, turns to the guy next to him and is like, look, look, it's me, I did this. And the guy's like, what, really? And, like, I thought for a minute that it was going to be one of those movies, and that guy was going to be like, I'm the owner of such and such cleaner. I will give you... And, like, no, it's not, because Mm -hmm. that's not... That's not real life, and that's not the kind of movie this is. Uh, apparently, uh, one of the endings that was shot was a scene at Christmas time where Johnny has uh, just gotten a new job at an advertising agency, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're all sitting around uh, the tree, and they got presents. Uh, and I think that apparently, in like the compromise with Louis B. Mayer, uh, theaters were given a choice of two endings that they could show. <laughs> Okay. That was the happy one, and there was the other one, Okay, uh, which is the one that we have. Um, and according to King Vidor, at least, most uh, theaters uh, opted for the this original ending. Okay. That's... under Well, that, I'm surprised, is yeah. all I have to say. I'm surprised that more people didn't want... Didn't want these characters to at least have some kind of joy in their lives. Some kind of happy ending. I bet it was just suffered. easier. I bet there was another thing they had to tape on oh, to the yeah, end of a reel to, or something right. like that. They had to make the change themselves. They were like, no, this is fine. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to say, uh, I don't know if where this fits in. Uh, in this interview I watched with King Vidor, uh, it seemed like he, you know, this was towards the beginning of his career. He'd made one big hit for a studio... Uh, called The Big Parade a couple years before this. Mm-hmm. And this was kind of his uh, blank check movie. It was like, uh, Big Parade was a huge hit, and he's like, I want to make a movie about 
just everyday life. My last movie was a big epic about war and what that does to a person. I want to know what just life does to a person. And he got to make this movie. And uh, it's it, uh, I got the impression, uh, hearing about his whole career, that he was really interested in, more than anything, just how average everyday people just react to situations that they're thrust in. He said that uh, his his lead actors would often come up to him and be like, my character doesn't do anything. My character's not making anything happen in this movie. And he was like, exactly. That's the point. And that does sort of go against all uh, screenwriting principles yeah, right. that uh, um, you hear nowadays. Narrative advice. Yeah. But, it, but I do think that it works in this movie's favor this movie does feel like it has a narrative thrust yeah even uh even though johnny's not doing anything strictly speaking he's sort of conscious although i guess he wouldn't think he is um but but he's consciously not choosing to do things yeah you know and that's that's sort of his narrative function Mm -hmm. is he's not doing the things that he should be doing to achieve the life he says he wants yeah yeah, and uh, you know, yeah, they t- they always tell you to uh, make sure your protagonist isn't you know active acting passively and stuff like that when you're writing a movie. But yeah, he's just the most passive dude. That's his that's his thing. That's his character yeah, trait. That's true. Other than going to New York, he like barely does any active things. He just like chills the yeah. rest of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great thing about this movie is that like montage at the beginning of new york yeah that's it just true. makes it seem like this just like monolith this yeah. just like this just incredible entity unto itself that just like i applauded I for new york when it came on the stream <laughs> yeah. so like it was you know like i was at the theater and the grand dom had just walked on the stage <laughs> and burst into applause yeah and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of um location filming in this movie a lot of these street scenes were shot in new york with hidden cameras there's even a shot uh late into the movie where you just see like this you know traffic cop directing traffic and he sort of like looks towards the camera and he's like all right come on move along move along and like he's looking at the camera chuck being like all right get out of here (laughs) but they left it in the movie that's pretty good Mm -hmm. yeah new york is a good character Mm -hmm. in this movie although uh you know, this movie paints her as a fickle bitch. I mean, who, well, she is. She is. Yeah. Uh, I, I I can't tell you the, the amount of times uh, I've just walked around in New York feeling a little sorry for myself, uh, feeling like living in New York, uh, just like that New York is just actively working against you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does have that feel mm-hmm. a lot of the time. But... But that's why when you beat it, it feels better. I wouldn't know. <laughs> there's, there's still haven't figured it out. There are small victories against New yes, York. I will they say they happen from time to time. Yeah. Just today, I was like, I had a nice day off. I walked down the street, threw some like cherry blossoms on the street. Uh-huh. I was just like, Yeah, you can't beat me, New York. <laughs> I'm having a nice spring day. Yeah, I, I feel like me living in New York lately, it's it's many days upon end of going like, ah, oh, New York sucks, I can't do anything, uh, the world is awful, and then, you know, one day I'll get to go out and walk around, like, the West Village, and then I'll just go, New York rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> New York is amazing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I just remembered that this movie. We're not going to talk about these other movies uh, here, um, so I'll mention this now. Uh, this is this movie is one of three movies I had seen from a or not three or maybe four movies I've seen from a one year period in this nineteen twenty seven twenty eight year that features uh, in the middle of people going down to Coney Island to have fun. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, there. I, there's, I, there's uh, Speedy. Shuttle. Do you remember yes, that movie? That's right. Do they go to Tony Island? Yeah. Oh yeah, they do. That's right. That's, and, it's a yeah. whole big long that's the whole, thing. Yeah, that's where they are. Right. 
Yeah, I had forgotten that was Coney Island. Yeah, and the other movies are uh, this movie Lonesome, which we haven't watched. Um, but I remember you telling me about it. Yeah, it's another one. It's there were so many movies about around this time about just like you know, boy meets girl, and they mm-hmm. try to make it in this crazy big world. Right. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the cameraman, a Buster Keaton movie, they go down to Coney Island, but it's not that one's not uh, like a romance like these other movies are. Okay. Um. I, you, it seemed like you were going to say something about Coney Island. Well, just that they have the they have really great shots of Coney Island in those movies. Too. Yeah, uh, they have uh, you know old Luna Park, which mm-hmm. now there's new Luna Park, which is supposed to look like no, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't really. It doesn't at all. But but they have shots of old Luna Park, and you can see the Wonder Wheel and stuff, mm-hmm. and it looks great. A plus. Recommend anything that has uh, old Coney Park, <laughs> Coney Island footage in it. Um, would yeah. recommend it to anybody. As uh, as my, I I feel like uh, this movie very accurately captures the spirit of New York City at times. Uh, but there's not a ton of great like footage of New York in right. this movie. There's you know there's like that montage at the beginning, at the beginning and some Coney yeah. Island footage. Right. Uh, and that's about but it. Uh, Speedy, on the other hand, is not really a good portrait of New York. That's the uh, Speedy's a the, Harold Lloyd movie yeah, from the, this time. Right. And it's the one where he it's he drives a cab or something. He like that, he or? Uh, his father owns like a like a horse cart which is like pulled on rails it's before they install the right. trolleys uh and he's gotta like uh get the 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 line running or else they the city gets possession of it or something right. like that but like and it ends with this stop it and, yeah. yeah and then it ends with this big uh horse cart chase through like downtown yep. Manhattan, the Lower and East Side. Th- and yeah, stuff. that's yeah. wonderful. You get some wonderful shots of uh, like Union Square yep. and the West Village, and yeah, that uh, one's great. Watch that one. Yeah, Speedy, <laughs> Speedy's a whole lot of fun, but it, uh, it's weird that has that one has a lot more like great New York footage. But I don't know if it doesn't really feel like a New York movie. No, yeah. I I agree with that. Um, but Speedy is also very good. Uh, not nominated for a uh, Best Picture, unfortunately. Rude. Uh, this movie was nominated for Best Director for King Vidor. Okay. Uh, he did not win. And it was nominated for Best Un- Unique and Artistic Production. Right. And I think, uh, I do think this is a sort of unique movie for the time. It's me- It maybe doesn't feel now as special as it might have at the time because, because like, the acting off it feels so real. You're kind of just like... Yeah, there's these people. They're acting this way, mm-hmm. but like this is not how movies used to be. Like we're okay. watching these these movies now. Uh, like we just watched Seventh Heaven, which we'll talk about next week, uh, and that one is such a heightened melodramatic movie compared to this. And I feel like Seventh Heaven is more in line with the kinds of movies they used to make back then. But I do think this is a unique uh, movie. It it feels very much like a a personal artistic statement from King yeah. Vidor. This was a passion project of his, and I feel like that comes across. I agree. Yeah. And uh, King Vidor went on to have a very long and successful career. I think he directed his last movie in the 1960s. I, this is the thing. I felt like his name was very familiar to me, but I don't know what is the movie that he did that I know. Um, I feel like it's a Bible movie, which is why when this movie he, started, I was like, is this a Bible movie? <laughs> and you were like, no. He did do... Um, well, his one of his last movies was uh, Solomon and Sheba from 1959, which is a biblical epic, but right. I don't think it's one of the more famous ones. No, I haven't seen that. Uh, he also directed uh, the American adaptation of War and Peace just a, a few years before that. That's uh, Henry Fonda and Audrey Hepburn, I think, are in that one. Okay. Um, he directed all sorts of things. He directed uh, The Fountainhead. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. I think that's why I've heard novel. his name before, okay. actually, even though I haven't seen that. And and that's uh, not biblical. No, uh, <laughs> it's sort of the opposite. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, and uh, I, I was happy to, to learn uh, in this uh, documentary I watched uh, about King Vidor that he didn't. He he said that he did not really. He thought he was an odd choice for the movie because he didn't particularly agree <laughs> with a lot of these politics. Um, but I think that maybe made him an interesting choice for the movie. Okay. He also, maybe his biggest claim to fame, even though he's uncredited on the movie, 
is uh, he directed some scenes of The Wizard of Oz oh, okay. when uh, Victor Fleming was called away to direct Gone with the Wind. He finished up uh, a lot of the uh, the beginning sepia tone sections. Mm. He uh, he said he would always get a thrill when uh, Over the Rainbow would show on te- television because he directed that. Nice. And that's probably the most famous uh, scene, scene he'll ever... Yeah. It's the most famous scene in the movie and the most famous uh, scene he'll ever direct, probably. And I think, uh, as part of the agreement, he agreed never to say that he directed the movie until Victor Fleming had passed away. Mm. Let him have all the glory. Right. Um, but then afterwards, he was like, I directed part of The Wizard of Oz. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's nice. Yep. Uh, he also, uh, after this, he directed a couple more silent films, and then he moved on to his first sound movie. It was called Hallelujah, and it was also the first uh, all-black cast musical. Ooh, that's yeah. interesting. Uh, and it was one of the very first musicals at all. And he went out of his way to uh, shoot out on location, uh, before they could sync up sound and have people lip sync in it. <laughs> so all of the musical numbers are not in sync, but he tried to give this movie a broader scope than they could with the regular sound equipment of the time, which I think is very interesting. Uh, and that's a quick, uh, that was a quick little thing about King Vidor. Uh, uh, he directed a semi-sequel to The Crowd in 1934. It's a movie called Our Daily Bread. And it's uh, I, it doesn't really have anything to do with these characters, but he used the names Johnny and Mary Sims again for the mm. main characters. Okay. And that one is about uh, collective farming. It's about a bunch of uh, people in a town who get together and decide that they're going to, till their own soil and work for their their daily bread uh rather than relying on uh you know uh commerce and right. capitalism Stores. they're gonna yeah um okay and he like mortgaged his house to pay for this movie or something it felt very strongly he about. wanted people to know they could do it yeah and it didn't work out no um Oh, and uh, one other, uh, I'm just reading all the trivia that I learned about this movie, basically. Uh, The lead character, I almost forgot to mention, the guy who plays, we didn't talk at all about the actors in this movie. No, we didn't. Uh, the the lead guy, uh, this leading actor, his name was James Murray, and he was just an extra on set. He was uh, was a day player in crowd scenes, and King Vidor just spotted him and liked his face. He wanted he wanted a guy with just a bland, uh, everyday but, American yeah. face. This guy is a huge facial expression. <laughs> yeah. Also, he's like, uh, actually, d- this is one of my questions because I okay. didn't, I forgot to look it up. Does he play his own dad? I don't think so. Okay. Because uh, at the very beginning, um, the to be fair, the picture wasn't that great. And the dad is making crazy faces when Johnny is born. And I was like, oh my god, I think that man's a demon. Um, and then later in the film, uh, I felt like uh, this guy was making the same faces. And then I thought, is it the same guy? Maybe they double cast him. I don't think you know? so, but okay. also Wikipedia doesn't list anybody as playing his dad in okay. particular. Okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, it this guy. Matter. But yeah. either way, my point is that he makes big, crazy faces. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this guy was just uh, an extra. Uh, King Vidor just liked his like bland, all-American face. He didn't want a leading man guy, and he didn't want anybody who was too ugly. He just wanted a guy in the middle. Right. And he thought, that guy, I like this guy. They, a- they asked him to come for a screen test, and he said, sure, and he just never showed up. <laughs> uh, they, How fact, Johnny Sims of Yeah, uh, they had to uh, pay him an extra's, uh, an extra's day wages for him to show up to the screen test. That's uh, good. Get yeah, the paper, man. Right? Uh, yeah, and then they, they cast him. And he had some some other leading-ish roles, but he never really uh, rose to prominence. He uh, fell into alcoholism. Uh, and uh, supposedly, uh, King Vidor ran into him on the street when he was like he was like a bum begging for change. And he, he ran into him and asked him to play the lead in Our Daily Bread. And he angrily refused the part. I think he pulled a real uh, Johnny and was like, I don't want your charity uh, part. Uh, and then... He lived his role. Yeah. And uh, in fact, uh, someone said that towards the end of life, he was making a living as a clown on the street. Uh, and then he just uh, died a, a pauper, his death or whatever. I don't know. That's is sad. Yeah, it is sad. Um, it was unfortunate. Oh, well. Yeah. Sorry, uh, maybe I'll, man, I'll, uh, whose name I still didn't learn. 
uh, James Murray. He okay. has, even has a bland name, yeah. too. Yeah, you might have even said it, and it just I slipped did right say out it. of my mind. Yeah. Oh, well. And uh, the one who plays Mary, uh, Eleanor, Ward- Bo- Eleanor Boardman, I thought she was uh, quite good. She was, was also she's good. King Vidor's uh, wife at the oh, time. Yeah. nice. Good for her. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, good for all of them. Yep. Yeah, she's good in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yep. The thing with these old movies, I often think the women in them are good, but I feel like they're all playing kind of the same part. Yeah, it definitely took uh, took a while for women's parts to vary significantly. Yeah. I feel like, like they're just playing long, like big eyed, long suffering mm-hmm. waif. You know? Yeah, I mean that that's that was the, that was pioneered by uh, D. W. Griffith with uh, the Gish sisters. Lillian, mm-hmm. Lillian Gish was like the. Uh, the prototypical wide-eyed wonder girl uh yeah just this thin little wisp of a woman with curly hair and these huge eyes Mm -hmm. uh yeah it's definitely a type that they liked in these older movies but yeah but she's good in this movie i Mm -hmm. especially like uh in the scene where they where they fight and uh where eventually she tells him that she's pregnant and stuff that scene is overacted like hell but Mm -hmm. but like just all the part where they're fighting, mm-hmm. I, it was just, like, extremely believable. Yeah. Like, I, I felt that girl. I felt that, like, you know, uh, like, uh, she, nothing in the house works, and, and it's not her job to fix any of it, but he wants her to fix all of it, and he's complaining to her why, why the, uh, the cabinet is, you know, won't stay, mm-hmm. and he hits her with it, and she has to just suck it up, and she's like, you know, and then they sit down, and they're eating, and he complains about her hair. Yeah, and like I wanted to, I wanted to shoot that man at that point. <laughs> like, and she, but she, it was very believable in that scene as a lady who was just who was just trying to suck it up, hmm. even though he is the worst. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was a crowd. That's the crowd. Uh, this movie was nominated for Best Unique and Artistic Production. I think it was uh, is a unique... It seems to be a unique movie. Yeah, I can't speak to whether or yeah. not it's unique is the thing. I guess if you want to talk about comparing it to Seventh Heaven, we can get to that in the Seventh Heaven. Yeah, that's true. We shouldn't talk about but, it now. Um, but I, I quite enjoyed this movie. I didn't enjoy it as much. <laughs> I did like... I appreciated it, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think the more that I read about it, the more I realized how interesting it was. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, I was just like, this is just this movie that makes me feel bad. Yeah, it kind of like passed me by, but like I keep finding myself thinking about it, Yeah, you know? It's well well crafted, I think. And and yeah, and I think it's interesting Mm -hmm. to to watch. Yeah. Okay, that does it for another episode of And the Nominees Were. Yeah, we got to... Yeah, we got to do an intro this time. We didn't do a lot, or an outro. We didn't do one last time. Oops. Uh, thank, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, please uh, rate us on iTunes. Leave us a review. It would be very nice to do. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Nominees Pod. You can send us uh, an email at Nominees Pod at gmail dot com. Uh, we would love to read. As uh, fan mail on the air, on the air, like where the radio. Whatever. <laughs> um, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at Nominees Pod. Yeah, we finally posted something. I've on posted Instagram. at least twice. That's pretty good. Um, I, I I can't promise good content, but you know, if you're like a visual person, no. you like to look at some pictures. I'm going to try. I'm gonna, passable content. Yeah. I'm really into these gifs, is the thing. Yeah, so, and uh, you can't do that on Instagram. No doesn't work we'll work it out yeah so. um but what else you can listen to us on uh, spotify and i think youtube now um but you're already listening to us so that's fine and we appreciate it yes we we appreciate you very much uh thank you for listening through this whole episode about uh, two movies you probably haven't seen no it's true and uh, i hope you stick around and listen to uh more episodes about movies you haven't seen and if nothing else, this miniseries is short. Yeah, it's six movies, but like you know, we did two this time. We're doing two again next week. Next week is uh, the two nominees for outstanding picture, and that is uh, the Racket and Seventh Heaven. And then after that, we'll be we'll do Sunrise, and after that, we'll do Wings. Yeah. And yeah, we'll, we'll probably. 
if we do a separate wrap up episode, it'll probably just be a little bonus thing before next week because I don't think we'll have an hour's worth of things to say. No, about that's 1927 true. this time. Yeah. Um, I know you hate it, but is there any? I just want to make sure you have said everything you wanted to say before I say goodbye. Um, I have said everything I want to say. I was trying to think of something clever to say related to the crowd, but no, I have nothing. Yeah, that's it. Uh, All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Bye. Bye.